One verse of scripture out of the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, I would like you to turn them there. Ephesians, chapter 6. Amen. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit more uh, as the message gets going this morning. Amen. How many have a Bible? Maybe not here in the church, but you have a Bible. Amen. Praise God. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. Amen. I think uh, I think we need to get reacquainted with our Bibles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm saying that to myself, too. Amen. It's so easy in the culture that we're living in. It's so easy to just kind of get used to using the phone because it's right there. We take it everywhere we go. And I, I use it all the time. I use it for research. I use it for reading scripture. Matter of fact, I've got to take it out because I'm using it for my notes today. Amen. My phone, my notes are on my phone uh, this morning. And so, um, but I want to read this one verse of scripture that's really, really probably, if you don't know it, then you're probably a new person in church and never been saved. Because I, pretty much everyone knows this verse of scripture. It's Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. And this is what it says. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high place there's a clause in here that i want to cite this morning and draw out from this verse of scripture because this is a very cautionary verse of scripture that the apostle paul has given to each and every one of us as believers he wants us to be aware of the fact that we are in a fight and our fight is not against flesh and blood. That's a good place to say amen to somebody. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against spiritual wickedness. It's against principalities in high places. But this one portion of verse of scripture really grabbed my attention. And really, I got revelation out of it a couple of weeks ago that I'd never seen before. Isn't it amazing how the word of God can always show you something fresh? Absolutely the truth. You can read a portion of scripture, a verse of scripture, memorize many scriptures, and someday, some morning, some time when you are before the Lord in personal devotion with him and you, God will show you something that you've never seen before, and you've read it a hundred times. Have I got a witness in the house of God today? Because the word of God is alive, it's quick, it's powerful. Amen. It, he always has the ability to, um, in some way, uh, some, kind, some type of way, show you something different and new. And so this portion of scripture is what the Lord showed me a couple of weeks ago. And I just want to begin in this place where he says, we wrestled against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world. The rulers of darkness of this world is where I want to take this message this morning. And the thought, uh, the title of my message, the thought and the title of my message, uh, we wrestle against um, this spiritual darkness. We wrestle against this rulers of darkness of this world. It's where I take my thought, and this is the thought, you better fight. I want you to know today that you are in a fight. And you better fight. Because if you don't learn to fight, the devil's going to take you down. Paul did not mince words. He did not... Uh, lightly step in this realm and area. He emphatically said that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we are in a spiritual fight. And we are in the fight of our lives. And it's worse now than it has ever been. The devil has brought a full-on assault against the world culture. Amen. And we need to be aware of that. We need to be on guard, and we better be ready to fight. Amen. This spiritual wickedness, this, this prince of darkness, this kingdom of darkness, that word darkness there doesn't mean black. It means shades of black. Shadows of black. Progressions or stages of blackness. In other words, shades of black could be you start out and just the shade, just the, just the beginning of the dust. My, my teenagers know this. I, I was teaching them about this. You just begin to enter into that place that you say, well, this isn't so bad. But it's the progression that keeps taking you down. It's that luring place that's like, you know what? 
I can still see. And it seems like everything's okay. I don't have to worry about stubbing my toe or tripping up because I still can see uh, my way. Do I have a witness today? He's saying that there are shades of black that start almost like a gray and moves you into deeper darkness. This is the word that is being spoken about here. Shades of black. And the entry into this principality, this kingdom of darkness, starts out seeming like it's not so bad. That I can see my way through this. But it's the lure that is used to get you into the things that later on you are going to regret in your life. We are in a spiritual warfare and we better learn to fight. Amen. And so there's three areas in which I want to talk to you about a little bit today about what do we need to fight for? Well, we need to fight for our faith, number one. Because the enemy is after your faith. And he's after your faith because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen. If he can zap you of all of your faith and get you to the place where you say, I don't care, it's too hard, I quit, I give up, I'm tired, I'm done. It's too much. And you throw away your relationship with God. The devil's got you right where he wants you. Wave at me. Because he's on the attack. Everything that the devil is doing in this day and hour, he's doing to invert everything that God has done. I've been doing a lot of research lately, and so my heart is full. I need help. Pray for me this morning to make sure I get through this the way that I need to get through this this morning. But there is such an assault of the devil upon this culture of today. I read not too long. It depends on what, where you go. I read not too long ago that uh, there are at least um, 57 to 79 or 80 something genders. They call it gender dysphoria or gender confusion or we've got it in our community. My grandson got put into a special class a couple of weeks ago because he misgendered a student at Sonora High School. It's in our community, and it's not only in our community, it is around the world. The devil is bringing confusion upon the minds of our kids. And it makes me mad. It makes me fighting mad, and it should make you fighting mad as well. Now, instead of being taught the ABCs, in kindergarten, they're being taught the L, B, G, T, Q, A and A and I, I think it, A and I plus two. How many knows that they're adding to their letters? They absolutely are. You need to Google that. Check it out and see if I'm telling I'm telling you the truth. Why is that? Because the devil wants to turn everything upside down from what God created it to be. God is very simple. In, in explaining to us how we are to reason our life in him. And so, so he, he gives us most of the time the comparisons of, of two things. Uh, he's very, um, biopic this way. He's, he, he says there is light and there is darkness. There is good and there is bad. There is right and there is wrong. There is God and there is the devil. There is heaven and there is hell. Thank you very much. There's, there's man and there is woman. They don't like that. Out there, they don't like that. There's man and there is woman. Don't get mad at me. That's what God said. We get back to the beginning of the book. Amen. Amen. God says, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make for him a helpmate, so I will bring to him a woman that will be complete complimentary to him. There's boy and there's girl and there is truth and there are lies. God is very bi not biopic in his uh, description of what life is to be like. It is man that wants to confuse it and it's the devil that wants to turn the confusion completely upside down and make wrong right. Darkness light. Lies the truth. Prophet said this day would come, and this day is here. When they will call light, they'll call darkness for light and evil for good. That day is here. We are in a fight, church. 
And we better get ready to fight. We better fight. Amen. Hallelujah. And so the answer to all of this is getting closer to God. Because when God began to understand in the beginning of creation that darkness was on the face of the deep and darkness is encroaching upon our culture worldwide, say worldwide, amen, it's not something just in our community, in our county, but it's worldwide. The answer to his darkness was light. Amen. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness, say darkness, darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Lord just threw that out of the window. He said, let there be light, and there was light. God, God can answer these uh, confusing times by a people that will walk in the light as he is in the light. Walking in the light as he is in the light. Amen. Jesus came, the Bible says in John, it says that in him was life and that life was the light of men. So we are called into light. Amen. But as you go down and read chapter, uh, verse 19 of St. John chapter 3, you find out that a lot of people rejected the light because they enjoyed their deeds because they were evil. And so I'm not here to convince you of anything today, but I'm here to tell you, you you've got a choice to make. Do you want to walk in the light or do you want to walk in the darkness? Do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? Do you want to be right or do you want to be wrong? It's your choice. It's your choice. Amen. Amen. It's, it's interesting to me that how, um, how important it is and, and how, um, how, Connected it is to the church, to the uh, the nation of Israel, as they were turning their back on God, they got out of God's will into their own will, and they left God for idols and for spirits. I'll talk about that a little bit, but let me just say this very quickly: get to these three points. You've got to fight for your faith. That's why I said you need to get your Bibles out. Dust off the covers. I'm not going to convict you that's God's job, but I'm going to tell you there's some in the church right here, right now, you haven't picked up your Bible for months. Well, what can we do? Why should, why should that matter? I'll tell you why that matters. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How can we have discernment of what our fight is and our battle is if we are not reading the Word of God for ourselves? Amen. Amen. I'm happy to be able to present to you the Word of God because you can get some faith by hearing, but once a week is not enough. And for some of you, you only come once a month. Did I say that? Our nourishment, our spiritual strength comes from the Word of God. Remember Jesus in the wilderness? Even, even the devil tried to trip him up and tried to get him to doubt his identity in God. If you are the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And Jesus said, I rebuke you, Satan, get behind me. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Get thee behind me, Satan, for you're to worship the Lord God only, and only him shall you serve. Amen. And so we can't have it both ways. Amen. And so we've got to fight for our faith. We've got to begin to get the word of God in us so he can get it through us. And we need to fight for faith. Build yourself up in your faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Build yourself strong in the Lord and in the power of his might because we are in a fight like never before in our lives. Without the word of God in our life, there is no spiritual discernment of what we are contending with, what we are fighting with, what is going on in our life. In St. John chapter 11, it talks about uh, Jesus talking about the kingdom of God advancing. He said the time is now when people, when the kingdom of God is going forward and the violent take it by force. And it goes on down in that context there. He says, what shall I liken this current generation to? It's like children playing in the marketplace. In other words, it's like the children that we all have or, or, or have had. And we're in this we're over there at Kohl's and we're shopping. And, and above the, in the rack, there's exchange being made. We're picking up, well, my wife is picking up clothes and, and saying, how do you like this? And how do you like that? I said, that's good. Let's get, let's get out. But, 
but but that doesn't happen. That that never happens. He puts it back on the rack, and we go around this way, and and maybe twice or three times back around the rack, and all through the store, zig and zag, and here and there, and 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 there's exchange being made up here. There's there's some type of something going to happen up here. But the kids are under the rack with their papa, with their with their with their grandpa, with with their with their daddy, and they're playing hide and seek underneath the rack, chasing each other, just trying to make time go faster so that the exchange can be made. And Jesus said, this is what the church is like. There's a lot of spiritual activity hovering over our head and blackness and darkness and spirits of lust and, and greed and attacks against the family and against the home and, and a desire is being ripped out of your heart to even be in the house of God. And we're just playing around under the rack like nothing is going on, nothing has changed, and nothing is wrong. I'm telling you right now, there's something wrong. Amen. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. Amen. Amen. So we have to fight for our faith and we need to build up our faith because when we build up our faith, we're going to take a stand. Goes on in chapter, chapter six of Ephesians. It says, after you've done all of this, stand. Take, take upon you the, the, the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then he says this, and this is an important point. And he says at the end of that, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. I've got some good news to tell you today. Your prayer life is powerful with God. You can pull down strongholds. You can break uh, generational curses. You can set the captive free by praying the demons off of your home and off of your family. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know if I really like that song too much. There's a verse in there. All I can give you is a hallelujah. I thought, well, that's kind of odd. I like the song, but, but I don't know about that verse. All I've got to give you is a hallelujah. Well, that's one of the greatest things you can do when your heart is filled up with faith. It's lifting your hands in, before the Lord. Say hallelujah, because that means praise and glory to almighty God. And he responds to that. He reciprocates it and comes down and blesses you for having a heart filled up with him and giving him praise and hallelujah. And so we, we must be filled up as the family of God with faith so we can communicate it and transfer it to somebody else. Amen. Hallelujah. And we've got to fight uh, for our faith. We have to fight for our family. Amen. We need to fight for our family. Let me try that over here. We need to fight for our family. Amen. Amen. Uh, you, you need to stop, mom and dad, letting your kids do whatever they, they want to do. Well, Johnny and Joy just didn't feel like coming to church today, so I let them stay home. That's wrong. I'm telling you right now, hold, I, get mad at me, but I'm telling you the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. I'm telling you the truth, okay? Paul even said, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? Jimmy and Johnny aren't going to learn about Jesus out on the soccer field. Or on the basketball court. Or in the dance studio. Who are they going to learn it at? I was talking to this group. I was talking to this group of young families years ago. I said, where do they learn faith in God if they're not coming to church? One of the parents spoke up to me and said, they don't. And it hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse. Now there's all of these things converging together. Have you noticed? Are you aware of the spiritual things that are going on over your head? Amen. When I was growing up, it was easier than this teenage generation. It was easier. So well, what do you mean, Pastor? It's pretty hard. Not as hard as today because now they have all this competing thing for their attention and their time. Because they can be out playing soccer or basketball or swimming or dancing or all kinds of stuff. Four squares would be next, maybe. I don't know. All kinds of things to get involved in. And none of those things are bad. It only becomes bad when you step over the line and take God's time. The time that should be to God for instruction, for drawing close, for revelation, for relationship, and the important into our lives that, man, I know Jesus. The most important thing, moms and dads, that you can fight for your family for is giving them Jesus. Wow. Giving them Jesus. Soccer is great. Dance is great. Basketball is great. I love sports. Amen. 
I'll, I'll make a little confession to you. When I first got saved, I was just like some of you. I love the Oakland Raiders. Now, some of you guys, that's okay. If you're not a Raiders fan, that's, don't, don't judge me. That was my team. I liked the Oakland Raiders. I was an East Bay guy. Grew up in the East Bay. I love the Oakland Raiders. When I first got saved, about the first year, maybe two, the Lord knows, amen. Sunday nights, if they played on Sunday nights, I would, I would get what's called a spiritual house, a spiritual, some type of spiritual sickness around 5.30. Around 5.30, I start feeling sick in my stomach. Like, oh, I don't feel too good. We had, we had 6 o'clock service on Sunday night, and the Raiders are playing. Uh, the, the Raiders are playing the Denver Broncos, and like, oh, man, I don't feel good. And my wife and her compassion would say, and she knew. I, I, now I've learned that she already knew. I think, oh, man, I have to hold it over on her again. She knew that, oh, just stay home. She would take off for church around a quarter to six. And I'd get the Doritos out and the Pepsi and turn on the TV and both have a great time. Unless they lost, which they normally did. And they still do. I think the Lord was trying to teach me a lesson. God got frustrated. Man, what's the matter with you? Oh, I'm still sick. Sicker now than I was before. But we have to, we have to, we have to guard our faith. We have to, we have to encourage people to, to be faithful to the things of God and transfer our faith to our family. My, your, as a parent, your greatest, your greatest, um, obligation is to do your best to give your children Jesus, to teach them about the Lord. We can't make them have Jesus. that time to go. Yeah. We can't make them have Jesus, but we certainly need to present to them Jesus. My pastor that I got saved under, great man of God, Reverend O.B. Engel, what a powerhouse. He would teach about family values and what it was to be important to convey Christianity. But he said, Someone came knocking on his door, born again Christian, knocking on his door, said, I'd like to invite you to our church. He said, I don't need church. He was a firefighter at that time. Showed up, opened the door with a beer in his hand. He said, I want to invite you to Jesus. I want to invite you to our church. He said, I don't need church. I don't need Jesus. I'm doing just fine. Had three little kids playing in the background in the house. And this minister said to him, said, well, you may not need Jesus. But what about them? He said it cut him to the heart because he's a family guy. He loved his kids. And a lot of times we forget that we might be saved. We might know the Bible. We might be listening to podcasts and all those things. But what about your children? What about them? We've got to fight for our kids. We've got to fight for our family. And let me just say this, and this isn't even a part of my message, but I'm going to say it anyway. Hold on to your seat. Amen. Your parents aren't your enemies. We've been there. We've done that. If we catch you lying and we put you on restriction, it's not because we hate you. It's because we're trying to help you. And listen, you get up 15, 14, 13, 12, I'm going backwards because nowadays, they're starting young. How many know that these kids are starting younger and younger? You better know it because it's happening. And you and, and your parents come to you and say, I'm fighting for your faith. I'm fighting for your anointing. I'm fighting for your life. No, you can't go on a date. I went to a wedding yesterday. The Lack family, uh, Chloe, got married yesterday to, um, to Daniel. Yeah, Daniel was here at our church for a while. Great young man. Yeah. Chloe said that in her in her vows, Chloe said that, yeah, when you first asked my dad if we can go on a date, he said no. Like shock. Why? Because dad said no because he had a point to make. I don't think you're ready, and you're not going to go on a date till I tell you you can go on a date because it's important for your anointing. To be protected. 
It was interesting. I know I'm on a sidebar here, but it's interesting. They they've never they had never kissed up until the point of their marriage. They had a covenant with each other not to kiss. I told my teenagers, where's my teenagers at? I, I see you guys back there. I've told my teenagers that be careful what you do with your emotions. There's a good chance if you're 12, 13, 14, 15, or 16, or 17, and sometimes even later than that, if you kiss somebody, you might be kissing someone else's boy, uh, someone else's husband or wife eventually. That's the truth. And I don't know what the statistic is. It's somewhere around in the high 80% chance that you're kissing some at that age, be careful with your emotions. That's why we're telling you. And I'll just say this as a pastor that's watching my girl. If you're today and you're trying to take advantage of one of my girls, watch out. You're going to make me mad. I'm going to be after you. I am going to get you. I am not going to let it happen. I'm not going to let it happen. Do we have any children in the house? Yes, we got one. Close your ears, case. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's no, okay. I'm not going to say it. So we fight for we fight for our faith. We fight for our family. We fight for our values. This is where it comes personal. It always comes personal. Say personal. Your relationship with God and my relationship with God always comes down to a personal issue. Thank God he gives us faith. He gives us the, the measure of faith. And thank God he allows us to grow in faith. We thank God for that, that he gives us a church, amen, to be, be able to sharpen each other in faith. And thank God for that and, and that we have family, that we can be protecting as a family to protect our faith and our relationship with God and, and not allow these encroaching dark spirits to come in and to begin to trick us. And tell us that uh, we're not a boy. This little kindergarten girl is start, it's starting it's a law. We're starting K through from from five years old to ten years old now. This LGBTQ AI plus two can actually teach transgenderism in our schools, and they do it very subtly, like the devil does. Here's the question they ask. They say, talking about a little kindergartner now, do you like boys better or girls better? Well, when I was going to school, it was like kindergarten girls had cooties. We didn't touch the girls. We didn't bother with the girls. They had cooties. And so did the boys. And so, of course, a kindergarten little girl or little boy. Let's say little girl. What do you like better? Kindergarten now, okay? These drag queens are coming into our schools. Drag queens are coming into our schools. Can I, should I say it again? You guys pay attention. We are in a fight. You like, you like boys better or girls better? Oh, I like girls better. Oh, you like girls better? You might be a lesbian. They're brainwashing and then they're doing something. Listen, it's, there's a name for it it's called grooming. Called grooming. This is happening. I'm telling you, we are in a fight of our lives. The devil is throwing everything he can at our culture to try to get us so mixed up that we don't know what to believe. They've got pronouns now. How many have heard of that? Yeah. Even even in our in our government, my pronouns are they, them, or whatever. It's like, you don't even know how you to talk anymore. That's the truth. Should I what should I call you? Don't you know? So this, this person at Sonora High School told my grandson that he wanted to be called her. And he refused. He said, you're he. And he got in trouble, went to the special class and had to be taught about not misgendering people that want to be called whatever they want to be called. One more, okay? And then I'll get back to preaching. We've got furries now. How many have heard of the furries? I am not joking. It is not a joke. 
They're tying tails and ears. And they're going to school and they're saying, I am a cat. I'm a fox. I'm a dog. I'm this, I'm that. And they're demanding these, these little kitties, boy or girl, are demanding cat boxes in the, in their classroom. How many have heard that for the first time? Let me see your hand. We are not aware of the battle that we're in. We are in a fight. I'm telling you, we're, it's a spiritual battle because the devil wants to rip off your identity. And so, so the comparison of that, the answer to that is God. The answer to that is getting back to the light. The answer to that is revealed in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19 when you see the great revival. We are on the cusp of the greatest revival the church has ever seen. Because when the darkness gets that dark, light is getting ready to explode on the scene. Amen. And God did it once, and he's going to do it again. Darkness was over the face of the deep, and God said, let there be light. And it caused the darkness to flee. And God's going to do it again. We find very interesting comparison in the book of, of First Kings, chapter 18 and 19. Elijah represents revival spirit. Amen. He's the man of God, but he represents revival spirit. Ahab, uh, excuse me. Uh, um, Jezebel represents a perverse spirit. And Ahab represents a permissive spirit. Without Ahab telling Jezebel, go ahead, she would have never had the authority to bring in all of those demon gods, which Baalism is demon gods. Baalism is, Baalism is pluralized for many different types of wicked spirits. And this is the thing, wicked spirits are encroaching upon our nation today. And we have a revival spirit in the house of the Lord. We have a revival Elijah spirit in the people of God that need to rise up and say no more. Amen. It will not go forward according to my word from this point forward until I say so. Because God has given each and every one of you the keys to the kingdom of heaven that you can bind whatever is on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. You need to take back your authority in Christ and say, I have had enough. Amen. I call it the anointing of Popeye. Amen. I've had all that I can stand and I can't stand no more. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to rise up and I'm going, to say, I'm going to draw a line in the sand and say, that's it. Amen. We're going to show you who's in charge here because even though the devil thinks he's in charge, God has always been in charge. He is the king of glory, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and he has the final say and word. Amen. Elijah shows up. Amen. What happens in this Jezebel generation is that they've been given permission by the church been given permission by the fathers and the mothers and the home to just try to go along to get along. That day is over, everybody. As a church, we need to stop going along to get along and get little Johnny and little Jimmy and little Joanna and say, no, you're not going to be able to stay home this week. You're going to go to church, amen, just like my mom and dad made me do because we backslid away from the principles and the standards and the values of what it means to hear the word of God, to be under the presence of the anointing of God, to get to the altar of God so that the fire of God can fall on them and make a difference, a change in a moment of time like nothing else can. Wow. Wow. We need to recognize what is going on. And so there's three things. There's three things that we find. Uh, Elijah begins to explain it to God as if God needed the explanation. But some of us do today. There are three things that we need as a church to get back what we've lost. The territory that we have as a Ahab spirit just surrendered and given permission to the enemy to do. The church has been silent and quiet for too long. You've got a word in your mouth that can burn and penetrate into a soul and make a difference in someone's life just like that. Hallelujah. There are three things that we find in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10. He says three identifying things. This, 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 this perversion 
that we are dealing with. Oh, help me, Holy Spirit. I'm gonna go, I'm getting sidetracked again here. Amen. Some of that perversion is just that gray blackness. Oh, yeah, you know, it's just a rated R movie. Oh, it just shows a little bit of, uh, you know, it doesn't really show them having sex. It just shows them in bed doing their thing. Close your ear, okay? Wave at me. How many's guilty? Don't raise your hand. We've allowed it to creep in and affect our standards of life. I know this isn't a, this isn't a popular message. I know it. I pray say, Lord, cover me with the blood. Amen. Amen. I know it because conviction doesn't feel good. But don't preach to me, Jesus, Pastor Kim. And let me see you in your house watching some rated R movie on the television and they're saying this word and that word and going to bed and sleeping with someone's neighbor and all that. Don't do that. You know what you are? You're a hypocrite. That's what you are because you're being entertained by the same spirit that you are trying to cast out. Maybe that's why we're having so much trouble with our children. That, that that old adage doesn't work. You do what I say, not do what I do. Mm -mm. It's not like that. It's like we need to get our values back. We need to get our standards back. If you, if you can't control the TV, there's a there is a remote that used to call the the on and off switch, but we don't even do that anymore. We spend more time looking for the remote than we do actually watching television most of the time. Not me. My wife can attest to that. I've watched very little television. I haven't got time for it. But that's me. But if you don't have enough control to allow that filth in your house, get rid of your TV. Well, what am I going to do without a TV? I mean, I've got 57 channels on there. Most of them I don't watch. Hello, somebody. I pay $200 a month for my... I don't. Just putting it out there, okay? Can we get a little bit of reason in here today? Pay $200 a month for my television, for my 57 channels, but I won't put $10 in the offering plate. God doesn't need your money. No, no, he doesn't need your money. And our church is doing just fine. But if you're not giving, you're not being blessed. Amen? We're doing just fine. But but don't don't spend $200 to have 57 channels and only watch two or three and then say you can't afford to give to the church. Boy, oh boy, I've really gone on a rabbit trail, haven't I? Three things. Let's get to this. Three things. We want, we want to get our power back, our influence back. We want to get, amen, our identity back. Three things is what, um, is what the brother said. Brother Elijah said this. He said, um, they have forsaken the covenant. In, in today's understanding, that would be that they have they have they have removed themselves from the word of God. And that's how our society is today. It's not what you obviously are. It's not what you obviously are. It's what you think you are. There was an interesting article last week where this this school over in the East Coast. The soccer team got, the soccer team got really upset because there was a, an identified transgender. In other words, he was just thinking, I'm a female, that went into the girls locker room legally because he said in his thinking, I'm female. There's no transgender action, no mutilation of the body, none of that kind of stuff has even happened. But because he could legally say, I'm a female, he was allowed into that girls, high school girls, locker room. That was bad enough, but he creeped all the girls out. He creeped them all out because, because he stood over on the side and watched them all dress and undress. Pervert. Perversion. Jezebel spirit that's been unleashed in our communities, around our nation. And around the world, the devil is on full-fledged attack, and you better learn to fight. You better fight. Amen. So they said, 
He said, number one, they've forsaken the covenant. They've lost the word of God. The only preaching they get, the only word they get, is if they come to church on Sunday morning, take a look around. Half the seats are empty today. I will do my metric measuring after church, and again, probably have around 40 people that call this their home church that are on the list. Usually, it, there's about 10% of them that, that exchange. So, you're here this week, and they'll be here next week, maybe. But there's generally around 40. That's, that's the old saying, right? Sally's like, if everybody would show up, I mean, we've heard that all of our lives. If everybody would show up, our church would be overflowing, and it would be. What's the problem? Everybody's not showing up. And it's worse now than ever. Can I give you one more statistic? Today's In today's um, church culture, Bar George Barna measured faithfulness around the world. And I don't know how this came out, 1.7. It doesn't even add up mathematically. I, that's their math. Said the average churchgoer goes to church 1.7 times a month, but they call it their home church. Well, our church has a better average than that, thank God, but we still have those that probably feel fit that category. What have they done? They've forsaken the covenant. They're not reading their Bibles at home. If I were to take a survey of this room and ask you guys, how many of you have read your Bible? Not your phone, not listened to a podcast, not watched YouTube, but actually picked up your Bible and read your Bible this week, I think we would be shocked. If, if we answered honestly, and we better, I would, I think we would be shocked how many actually have and how many haven't. And for, for Pastor Kim, I'm not your judge. I'm just your preacher trying to get you to get convicted by the judge. We would be shocked, but we're just a microcosm of the truth of where we're at spiritually. And we're in that, we're in that Ahab anointing where we are just permitting ourselves to be bombarded by the spirit of darkness. We might be in that place of shades of black where we feel like we're doing okay. Hey, at least I'm in church. I mean, I mean, I, I can almost hear you guys thinking, I didn't, I don't go to church to be bombarded like this, Pastor Kim. No, you need this today. Because it's not just about you. Can hey, hold on to your seat. It's not just about you. It's about your family. It's about your kids. It's about it's about your extended family. It's about it's about your community. It's about your state. It's about your nation. They want us to believe a lie and be damned. I'm not going to do it. I'm calling the church, I'm calling you today to a Bible revival. There's something about this book that's different than watching it on a telephone or a YouTube service. There's something different about the Bible. Get it in your hands and open it up. If you don't know where to turn to it, get, you a, get yourself a Bible reading plan that just keeps you on track to read something somewhere. It's amazing. It's amazing how you will start feeling closer to God. And we need to get the covenant back. He said, Brother Elijah said, they forsake in the word of God. Amos said in Amos 9, 9, the day will come when great famine will be upon the land. It won't be a famine of meat nor of drink. It will be a famine of hearing the word of God. We're here. We're here. So forsaking the covenant, breaking down the altars. Breaking down the altars. We have to rebuild the altar. You find the scripture, verse 30 in 1 Kings chapter 18, after the false prophets, the, the ones that are full of devils, could not get fire to fall from heaven and consume the sacrifice. Verse 30, 1 Kings 18, 30 says, and Elijah repaired the altar that had been broken down. We have to repair our altar. What does that mean? Well, that means that we need to regain a prayer life. I'm telling you, I'm set on fire since the last few weeks when we have seen these tremendous miracles take place. 
we, we see reference to, to Elijah in James chapter 5, where, where James says Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, and yet he prayed, and the earth did not give rain for the space of three years. And he prayed again, and the rains came. And he says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Well, what does that mean? It means that when, when we put full energy, that word is uh, effective, is uh, energeos. It means to put put impact and energy into it. It's, it's a desperation. God, we need to change. God, we need to move. God, we need revival. Lord, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Lord, Gail needs a miracle. She's got a 25% chance of, of living. And you get desperation prayers and you're like, I'm telling you, I believe it with all of my heart. This is not just a preachy type of message. I'm telling you a truth where God will radically change everything when you get serious with prayer. He rebuilt the altars. And then the third point, this is a little bit personal, so you guys just give me grace here. It says that they killed the prophet with the sword. The sword is a symbol of our mouth, the things we speak. We're living in a day, I've seen many, many uh, comparisons in, in uh, articles and stuff where they're saying, you know what, the preacher, the pastor, uh, that person is, uh, they're no different than we are. In a lot of respects, that's true. But not when it comes to the calling of God to the position or the office of a pastor. It is different. It is so different. Amen. I'm just here to just kind of just maybe just tell you this this morning. Amen. If that's your feeling, that is killing the prophet with the sword. That is demeaning the office that God has placed as fivefold. God gave. God title. Well, you know, they just want a title. No. No. Pastor Jay is Pastor Jay. He's not just Jay. He's Pastor Jay. And he's been known as Pastor. That's his identity. Not his title. That's your identity. You are Pastor Jay. That's my identity. I'm Pastor Kim. And it's not a title. I, I don't care about titles either. But that's my identity. And I was thinking about that and praying about that. God help our culture. And you'll find all kinds of articles. Pastors, you know, everybody's the same. And I just came to say this to you. So you'll know where I'm coming from. You start spending at least five hours a day in prayer in reading the Word of God. Five hours a day in prayer and reading the Word of God and in research. Five hours a day, every day, including today. You do that, then come and talk to me. Then tell me that you are equal. Then I'll say, okay, then, then, then I'll call you a pastor if that's what you want to be called. I'm telling you the truth without exaggeration. My wife, will attest to that. I'm up every single day seeking the Lord for you. Because I'm fighting. I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for your faith. I'm fighting for your family. I'm fighting for God to do a work in our lives. Amen. I'm fighting for the value to come up in the house of God. No brag. Not bragging. I'm telling you where I am at. And I'm not doing to say, I'm, look at me, I'm somebody. But God knows my heart. God knows my, he, he knows that I'm very, very careful not to bring some type of spiritual pride. Because pride comes before a fall. But I'm here to fight against that spirit that wants to diminish the call of God in people's lives. Because that's the trick of the devil. If you be the son of God, if you're a pastor, if you're a teacher, if you're this or that, no. God is calling us. There's a resounding call. After the fire of God fell on the sacrifice, Elijah said, now go and expect something to take place. There's a ship coming. Elijah said, there's a ship coming. Look upon the sea. Because I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Some, God is doing something. And I expect it to happen soon. This message...
today. I want to impart something to your life to cause you to know you are in error. To let go of the word of God. Get your Bibles back. You are making a mistake to just look, look upon your own life and not consider your children. Mom, dad, cousin, uncle, dad, whatever relation you are, show yourself faithful to the house of God. And your kids will follow. Why do you want to drink? Well, I drink because my parents drink. Why do you want to smoke? I want to smoke because my parents smoke. You, mom and dad, you parents, you uncles, you cousins, you, you are the greatest example to those that are closest to you than the church is. My prayer is we can get your children. We can get you here once a week. God, that would be awesome if we could get everybody here once a week. But you have influence seven days a week. The success of ministry, the success of salvation, the success of perpetuating Christianity and the kingdom of God is going to require us to stop playing in the rack when we know that there is spiritual exchange and darkness encroaching upon us, above us. Amen. Would you bow your head? Oh. Lord, in this part of the service, I just depend on you to confirm whatever you're doing in the heart. This is up to you and up to them. So I just pray for response here. I've done the best I could do that you've given me to do. Now the rest is up to them and up to me. I want to ask you this morning as we open these altars to respond to this message. And if God has spoke to your heart and brought conviction and you know that you want to be better, you want to be rededicate and commit yourself to God because you want to walk in His life and not in darkness. Would you get up out of your seat and come to the front of the church and find a place to pray? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Stand your feet all around this place. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just wait, just wait. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Stretch forth your hands to these that are responded this morning. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we know that the answer to the darkness is your light, the light of truth. Lord, you've spoken to the heart of the church. Lord, as these have come up this morning, we ask, Lord, that you meet us here. And Lord God, you really do a work in our lives. Lord, that we do an examination of where we are at. Let there be no pretense. Let there be no insincerity. Let us honestly examine our lives before you today and say, we want revival. As perversion and permission has encroached upon us, Lord God, because of our lack of revival anointing, we, we just push back on it. We rise up, Lord God, as the fire of revivals fall, Lord, that you're going to raise us up into new people. And as the children of Israel on Carmel said, the Lord is God. 
Lord, we say today, you, you are Lord, and you are God. You are Lord, and you are God. Hallelujah. You are Lord, and you are God. Thank you, Jesus.